Good morning. It's nice to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. It's my first time in Madrid. Who else is here for the first time? Who is a Madrid virgin? <laughs> yeah? Right, there's, there's lots of them. Antonio, I want you by the end of this uh, session to create 50 badges with I am a Madrid virgin on it, okay? We can all wear them. That would be great, won't it? Um, you're going to have a great time at this event, I think. It's a wonderful conference. I didn't know much about it until I arrived, but I've now seen that it's amazing scope, some great papers to look at, so you're going to have a great time. I didn't have such a great time yesterday checking into Heathrow Terminal 5 for my flight. I walked up to the checkout desk, uh, check-in desk and um, presented my passport, and the lady looked me up and down, and she looked on the computer, and she looked at me again, and then she took a sticker... She stuck it on my bag and it said mad on it. <laughs> and then I thought, how does she know me? <laughs> and then she put another one on the other bag and I thought, this is not a, this is not a, a, a kind of a, a mistake here. This is a trend that's going on. You know, she must, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking this is rather amazing because uh, they, they know all about me. They know I'm mad. When you're a psychologist, you see, which I am, you either you start out by being mad or you end up coming out mad. So anyway, um, so I thought, then I realized what, what she'd done. What, what happens is, you know, all air, airlines have a propensity to put the first three letters of the place you're going to on your bag, don't they? So they know where the bag's going. So I'm looking forward now to going to Singapore <laughs> in September. And when I get into um, difficulties with the authorities, I say, well, the, the airlines gave me an instruction here to be naughty. So anyway, I, I thought um, it, it would be uh, great just to show you a few slides here. Um, this is the, the presentation that I'm going to be talking about this one. I'm going to be talking about perceptions. As a psychologist, I'm interested in how we perceive things and how we behave when we perceive things. And uh, from what Charles was saying earlier on, a lot of that resonates with my work because there's a lot of issues in terms of misunderstanding. As, as in the case of misunderstanding where your bags are going, you know, sometimes you arrive and your bags don't. You know, that's even worse, isn't it? Um, so there are lots of misunderstandings in education. And they're often caused by perceptual gulfs, or, or the gap, as I call it. And here's, here's one interesting one. I, I like this one because it challenges your perceptions, doesn't it? This could very well be my father. It's not, but it could be. My father is 87. My father is 87. My daughter is 20. Imagine the gulf between them. They love each other very much, but there's a huge gulf between them. You know, 67 years of living in between the two of them. My father, a couple of years ago, I, I convinced him to go onto Facebook. Right? And uh, he gets onto Facebook and has a look around. Then he realizes he can connect with people. So he looks around to see who he knows. And he sees my daughter. <laughs> so he connects with her. He friends her on Facebook. My daughter is shocked at this because she was only 18 at the time. And, she, and the first status update from her is WTF, granddad's on Facebook. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh. I could see it happening. And then... Um, I thought, what's she going to say back to him? Because he says to her, what does WTF mean? <laughs> oh, no, what's she going to respond with? And she thinks about it for a while, and she responds, welcome to Facebook, Grandad. <laughs> I thought that was very smart of her. Don't you think that's smart? Yeah? I mean, she was, she's a smart kid, but um, the trouble is now he uses it with all his friends. <laughs> you know, WTF, Vicar, you know. It, it's, it's one of these memes that kind of happens. You know, there's lots of misunderstandings when two generations or three generations share a digital space together. And as you know, in the workplace, this often happens. These misunderstandings, these perceptions in uh, the gulfs in, 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 in the kind of the system. Here's another one, another little gap, which we need to be aware of. It's not a little one. It's actually quite big. It's the digital divide. Gibson says... The future's here, but it's not evenly distributed. And there's so many different divides, digital divides. There, of course, there's the economic and the social divide, the haves and the have-nots. But there's also the cans and the cannots. And the wills and the will-nots, the technophobes. Every society has them. And sometimes people are excluded because of this 
this gulf, this gap in our ability to connect with each other because we don't have the technology or we can't use it or we don't want to use it. So we have to be aware of these, these gaps. Here's another one. This is a picture of Macy's. Anyone been to Macy's in New York, the one I'm talking about? This is just on Broadway. And I was there last year, two years ago, and I took this picture. But really, it's been around for a lot longer. And there's a wonderful story about Macy's, which I'll tell you very briefly, which illustrates the point very interestingly. Now, it seems that there was a family living in the Blue Hills of Virginia. And they won a competition to go to the Big Apple. They were quite primitive people. Bearing in mind, this is 1913. They had no electricity, no running water. Um, they took their water from a well. What they, 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 ate, they either traded for or they hunted. And they won this competition to go to the Big Apple. And so they got into their best clothes. They'd never been outside their, their um, little hamlet before, their little village before. And they go on this Greyhound bus and it takes them two days. And they get there and they arrive in Times Square. And they get out and they stare at all the massive buildings the great big skyscrapers that are going up everywhere. And they, they know that there, there are people around them more than they've ever seen in their lives before. They didn't even know there were that many people in the world. And after a few minutes of staring around amazed at how big the place was, the wife says to the husband, come on, let's go to Macy's. I've heard a lot about it. And uh, they get down to Macy's, three blocks down. And they get inside this great big building. And it's the biggest department store in the world. And they go inside the atrium, which is about five times the size of this room. And there are people running everywhere. There are staircases going up and down. It's chaos. And they stand there bewildered again. And then the woman says to her daughter, come on, we're going to the women's fashions. And she leaves the poor guy standing there with his son. And they're standing there in the middle of this place, wondering what to do next. And he looks around. And over in the corner, he notices a line. A queue is forming. So he goes over to have a look. And as he looks, he notices that the queue is forming in front of this door. This kind of door that opens in the wall. And people go in to the door, and the door shuts. And a little dial above goes, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> four, three, two, one. And the door is open. And the people have changed. <laughs> he sees this happening again and again. The door opening and shutting, and the people coming out changed. And then he notices a little lady going in, a little old woman with a cane, a walking stick. And she walks in very slowly. She walks in and the door is shut. And the dial goes, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. And the door is open. And out walks a beautiful blonde woman. <laughs> and he stares at her. And he turns to his son and he says, son, go and get your mother. <laughs> The interesting thing about this is that when we see new technologies, we are seduced by them. We become bewildered by them. It's new. It's, it's wonderful. It, we want it. And this is the problem. Lots of schools, they see new technologies and they buy into them without knowing what they're going to do with them. And that's a big mistake because often the problem should come first and then you try to find the solution. So if you're looking at new technology with the view of trying to buy it because everybody else is, don't be seduced by it. Think about the problem first and how you're going to solve it. And then maybe there, there'll be a technology that will come along that will be the right fit for that, that problem. Uh, so we've got to be careful that the gaps in our perception take all sorts of forms. Here's another one. This is Alexander Graham Bell on the telephone. He says, truly I believe that one day there'll be a telephone in every town in America. He was right. There is. I've been there. I see telephones in every town in America. Trouble is, there's also one in everyone's pocket now as well. Alexander Graham Bell was predicting the future on the basis of what he knew there and then. It's very difficult to predict the future with our current mindset. We have to be very careful about trying to predict the future. Um, here's the first mobile phone. In fact, that's two. It's a his and hers there, you know. Um, they were huge, first mobile phones. But um, who, who could know that one day we'd have this? Do you know what this is? I took this picture two years ago at Stratford, um, just outside where the Olympic Park is in London. And it's uh, a mobile phone charging station. You now find those in airports. You'll find them in shopping centers and malls. You'll find them in hotels all around the world. 
We couldn't predict that this would happen. It's very difficult to predict the future. This is a painting by the French artist Villemar, painted in 1910. He was asked to predict the future of education. This is what he drew. It's interesting, isn't it? Can you see what he's done here? I don't know what this poor guy here has uh, done to actually, you know, to be standing there. He must be, you know, in trouble. You know, must be having to, to work the debt off or something. But the thing is, what Vilmar was doing was he was thinking of, of the, the model of the time. And we don't see schools like this now, do we? What we should be looking at, whoops, let's go back. What we should be looking at is disruptive technology, technology that really disrupts everything we do to the point where um, it changes forever. It transforms our experience. It transforms the experience of our, our students. Every man, says Voltaire, is a creature of the age in which he lives, and few are able to raise themselves above the ideas of the time. We've got to be so careful. This is how we predict the future. We look back on it, and then we see what the trends might be. And uh, a couple of years ago, well, last year, in fact, um, I was speaking at a conference, and I said, I think the future is going to be pervasive technology now, because smart technology is here already. Mobile we have. The next stage is to make this so pervasive that it becomes invisible, so that we don't even think about using it. We just do. The problem we've got in schools and in universities and in colleges is the technology is so complex that learners and teachers spend more time trying to navigate around the damn thing than they do actually learning. And we need a, a redesign of everything. And that's why I'm saying that we should have technology that's invisible or at least transparent so that we can see through it. I'm going to talk about the future again in a minute, but let's talk about the past a moment. This is me when I was eight years old. Butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. He was a lovely little lad. I, I was quite shy at school, actually. And um, a lot of things happened in school. One of the things that happened in school was I went to see my, um, I suppose you would call him a careers guidance teacher at one point. And, I, and he said to me, OK, um, you're going to be leaving school soon. I was about 17 at the time, 16 at the time. He said, you're going to be leaving school soon. What do you want to be? What are you going to do? And this was the time of the moon landings, 1970s, the early 70s. I said, I want to be an astronaut, sir. And he looked at me and he said, uh, don't be stupid. <coughs> astronaut? He said, that's not a real job. I said, yes, it is, sir. They get, to do, um, they get to fly in rockets and they get money and all sorts of stuff. And he said, no, you can't be an astronaut. I said, why not? He said, because you're not an American. <laughs> and I said, well, there are Russians as well, sir. They're called cosmonauts. He says, don't be a smart ass. What are you good at? I said, well, not much really. I'm good at art. I'm good at music. He said, well, go and find a career in music or art then. Good luck. And that was the end of it. I thought, you know, what's the point of that? So this did inspire me then. It inspired me. I wanted to become an astronaut, but I wanted more than that. He, he didn't read between the lines. And often teachers miss the gap between what the child is saying and what they expect the child to say. What I was really asking was, I want to be an explorer. I want to go and find things and discover things I've never seen before, that nobody's ever seen before. And in fact, that's exactly what I've become in one way. I've become a researcher. I've become a person who is one of those guys who goes off and tries to find new ways to use technologies to learn and to teach, and new ways to, to, to apply pedagogy. So in effect, I have become a bit of an astronaut, but from another cosmos, if you like. And um, when you look at school itself, education, I know, this is, this is real, this, this is permanent. It's pointing the way to learning. I'll, re I'll echo what Charles said earlier on, but in a different way. Dave Truss, who's a great educator, he used to be in China, he's now in Canada again, said the goal of education is actually not to teach subjects, but it's to teach students. That's a great quote, actually, which you can read for yourself. And it's important that we look at our students. Here's assessment for you. Can you see this? This is a test in a primary school to name the quadrilateral. So this is Bob. That's Sam. There's even one here called Harry. This is a failure in pedagogy. 
It's a failure in the testing system. It's not a failure for the child. She is following the instructions. Here's another one. Write the following words in alphabetical order. <laughs> this child has followed the instructions. He got a zero for that. Is that fair? I think this is a brilliant answer. This child very, may very well be autistic. He has followed it to the latter. See what I did there? But he really has put them in alphabetical order. It's a failure in pedagogy. It's a failure in our assessment system. A child said to me once, why, oh why, are we tested on what we're taught instead of on what we've learned? Think about it. Education systems are failing because we are teaching a curriculum that's not just out of date, but it's irrelevant as well in many ways. And I'll come to, in a moment, um, how, um, how that might change. Three biggest fears of a teacher using technology. Do you identify with this? How do I make it work? How do I avoid looking like an idiot? And they will know more about it than I do. Oh, oh my gosh. This is... Uh, on the basis of lots of conversations I've had with teachers talking about how they use technology. Now, let's contrast that with the three biggest fears of some of, some of our students. The three biggest fears of our students using technology. Big difference, isn't it? Yeah? Would you agree? Massive difference between that and that. They don't worry about Anything like that, they worry about whether they're going to get connections, whether their battery's going to die. That's their biggest fear. So there's a huge gap between the way teachers see technology and the way children see technology, generally speaking. I am generalizing here. So um, another one is flipping the classroom. Anyone heard of flipping the classroom? The idea behind that is that instead of instructing in the classroom, what you do is you put the instruction onto um, digital technology and the children learn it away or the students learn it away from the classroom and then they come in and do the most difficult part which is the assimilation of it. They learn by, um, by discussing and by um, collaborating in the classroom instead of by just being instructed. And I think that's a great idea but I think we can take this a lot farther. And um, Aaron Sams and, um, and uh, uh, Bergman, uh, these guys are on the right track, but I think we can take it a lot farther. I, I, I actually propose flipping the teacher as well. Now, if I'd said that in school, I'd have got into trouble. You know, I'm going to flip the teacher. But to actually flip the teacher actually means that the teacher becomes the learner and the learner becomes the teacher. We learn by teaching. So a lot of my students are tasked to go away and, and teach me something. Go away and find something new that I don't know and come and teach me. And that's a big challenge. And they go away and they do it and they come back. And I become their awkward student. And it makes them think harder. It makes them think critically. And also, uh, obviously, we're going to get them to make things. So again, what Charles was saying about go uh, schools making things. There are now maker spaces in many schools. Have you heard of these? I heard of a school recently that, um, and I wrote about it on my blog, a school that um, took a broken computer, a computer that was in pieces, and they put it in a corridor and with a sign next to it. And the sign said, Whoever fixes this computer and brings it to room such and such will get a prize. 24 hours later, a young lad turns up with the computer fixed. He was really pleased with himself that he'd managed to fix the computer. He was so pleased, in fact, and so excited, he forgot to claim his prize. The next day, there were several other boys at the door saying, um, we want to have a chance at doing that as well. He beat us to it. And then there were some girls arriving saying, we think we can do that quicker than the boys. Suddenly the whole school was excited about making things and about creating things and about fixing things and about meeting challenges. Challenge-based learning is very powerful indeed. So is collaboration. So is making things. This should be in future curricula. Read that any way you like. But any way you like, children will use technology in the classroom, whether you ban it or not. And... Mobile phones are banned in schools because of all these reasons. I won't go into this now because we'll run out of time. But one of the reasons that teachers fear 
is losing control over the learning context, losing control over the lesson. And I often say to teachers, why are you worried about losing control? Why can't you give the control over to the students? Why can't you give them the responsibility to drive the lessons and you act as a facilitator? And of course, there are all sorts of um, issues with that, which we won't go into now, but if you want to debate this with me afterwards, that's fine, we can do that. Um, I want to ask you, what is this? We're talking about texting now. What is this? Can anyone recognize it? Anyone got it? At the back. Hooray, yes it is. Thank you, Bex. One of my students there. <laughs> Hooray. Yes, um, it's the Lord's Prayer. Can you see it? But you've got to do it in, in street talk, you know, like. You've got to talk like the kids, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, uh, rescue us from the evil one, for you are always the most excellent dude. Yo! <laughs> yeah? You've got to do it like that, really. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. This is very creative. And... Teachers often worry about texting, dumbing down the English language. I'd like to say to them, actually, that, that most students know the difference between this and writing a, an academic essay. And they do separate the two. In fact, what I would suggest to you is that in today's very technology-rich society, children are actually learning more literacies than we ever had to learn at school ourselves. And they are becoming brilliant at communicating in different ways. So... That was it, the Lord's Prayer in 160 characters. Um, this is students taking notes. <laughs> they will find ways to use technology which we haven't even dreamt of. Someone says, ah, well, that's not really learning. Ah, but you don't know what they do with it next. What they do with it next is up to them, and it's many, many different ways they can use it from now on, once they've captured that. I see lots of you taking pictures of slides today. You're learning to do it as well, um, because it's useful, it's got a purpose to it, and you can do it. It's as simple as that. And there are lots of other things that we can talk about. But John Waters did some research a few years back, and he, he found that the students actually have these traits today. And the most important one, I think, is at the bottom. They become oriented to becoming their own nodes of production. They produce things themselves now. They, they don't only consume content, they also produce content. They repurpose, they remix content, they question that content, and they share that content. And I'll come to that again in a moment. They need much more than that. What I'm suggesting is that they need various other things. I show my students this, and I say, what's wrong with it? And they go, ooh, what's wrong with this? And they scratch their heads, and they go, ooh. Is it 70%? No. <laughs> nope. Ah, that's not Thomas Edison. Ah, yes, it is. And eventually, well, they get it. One, one of my students took, took nearly a minute the other day to actually work this one out for herself, what was wrong with it. You see, what they need is they need digital wisdom. They need the ability to discern the difference between good and bad content. They need the ability to be able to see how relevant content is and what the provenance of it is, where it comes from. There's lots of different things that they need. Um, this is um, a quote from Abraham Lincoln, almost. That's not a real picture, by the way, all right? Just, just in case you, you wondered. This is, um, this is uh, just to say the point that, look, when you take pictures of yourself, there are issues. Some of my students recently have got into a lot of trouble for, t for, for, for uh, posting out or tweeting out various things which they shouldn't be tweeting out. And the problem is, this is their digital reputation on, on the line. This is... Not just theirs, but also the reputation of the institute they belong to. If you've got students tweeting out stuff, which includes maybe selfies, you know, which maybe aren't that palatable, maybe they've got a picture of themselves falling out of a bar at 3 o'clock in the morning or something, then that could be a problem later on. That's a legacy that will come back to bite them in years to come when they go to apply for a job or whatever. So we've got to be very careful. Here are some of the new literacies that we're identifying. This is not exhaustive. But I think, again, this echoes a lot of what Charles was saying earlier on. I want to point out this one to you, transliteracy. This is a word that describes the ability for people to be able to present themselves equally well across multiple platforms. This is going to become one of the new literacies. It's part of the cultural capital of this generation. 
And this kind of thing, I think, needs to be inculcated, uh, in, in, implied, if you like, but also um, explicated in curricula. Um, learning 2.0, we start to call this. We start to call this the new ways of learning, which involve technologies, it involves collaboration, it involves connecting with other people around the world, it involves connecting with new, new resources and so on, and creating them yourselves. And right at the bottom, you have skills. Now, I learned to drive a car in the United Kingdom, where you drive on the left-hand side of the road, and you sit on the right-hand side of the car, and you have a whole host of rules to follow, which we call the highway code, and uh, that includes you know, stopping at traffic lights, and, and there are certain signs that you need to remember, and so on, speed limits. And those skills, eventually, when I learned to stop driving into the curb, actually became competencies. And in fact, now I drive to work, and I don't remember driving to work. It's scary, isn't it? That's a competency. It becomes unconscious. When I went to America to work, I had to drive on the right side of the road and the left side of the car, and there were unwritten rules. There. Who's from America here? Several of you. Now, what happens when four of you arrive at the same time at a crossroad? Who, who goes first? It's crazy, and nobody, you know, nobody could tell me who went first, so... I already hacked off a few other drivers, I'll tell you, for the first few times. But what I had to do was learn a whole new set of literacies, which were based on my previous competencies and skills. And I put it to you that going into a digital environment is a bit alien. It's a bit like driving in a new country with new rules. Before you reach mastery, you've got to re reapply, if you like, your, your skills and competencies to, to have new literacies to be able to attain that mastery. And it takes a long time. It's all about cultural implications. Um, let me ask um, this young lady here a question. I was going to pounce on you. You didn't know that, did you? I'm going to pounce on you in a minute. Over there. But um, let me ask you a question. What's your name first? Miriam. Miriam. You've got a great memory. Miriam here, okay? Miriam here and me, we have a distance between us. What is that distance? Three meters. Okay, that's measurable, isn't it? Near enough? Three meters? One and a half meters. Okay, you're already disputing it, you see. It's a measurement, but you dispute the measurement. You don't know what the distance is really unless you measure it. Okay, now, what other distances might there be between, be between me and her? Anyone? Age. 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 Yes, she's a lot older than me. Right? <laughs> right? Not right now, dear. Okay, later on maybe. She said sex. I mean, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. You, you mean gender, okay? Gender, yeah, which is a culturally... So gender is, is also a distance. What else might there be? Language, Language might be, yeah, uh, ethnicity, anything. There's lots of distances between us. George Harrison, one of the Beatles, you remember them? He said, he, he once wrote a song called Within You, Without You, which was, called, which was um, one of the lines in it was, I was thinking about the space between us all and the people that hide themselves behind a wall of illusion. And there's a space between each of us. It's a perceptual distance, mainly. I don't, I don't believe that there is any geographical distance anymore in terms of what we do with technology, but I believe that there are lots of perceptual distances. And language is one of them. I saw someone this morning, they may even be in this room, they tried to ask the person in the restaurant a question, and there was a language barrier. And the woman didn't understand her, and in the end she just walked off. She would find someone else who could speak the language. You know, I, I, once I was in Paris with some friends and I thought, I'll show off. So I ordered the entire meal in French. And they came with a silk tie and a hip bath. I thought, you know, that, that's not right. And, and there's a washing machine as well they came with. They, all, these, all these items they came with, and it was all the wrong items. That was a joke, by the way. It wasn't real. It didn't actually happen. But um, can you see the language dis distance that we have is quite vital to overcome. Now, technology is going to solve that one day. But at the moment, it's very flaky. And we've got to think about new topologies. And here are some of the ways that you can predict or, 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 um, or kind of um, look to the future. Some of the, the concepts that we're looking at here. Distributed cloud computing. We know this already exists. This is the infrastructure. Then we have things like 3D visualization. We know that things like gestural computing are coming. They're already here in the form of Xbox 360 Connect. 
But uh, I, I, I predict a time when actually we will see a lot of people using their hands to control computers. It's no longer going to be just the minority report. It's going to be everyday average existence. Tools, smart mobile technologies, and things like collaborative intelligent filtering where, in fact, what happens is you all help to devise the content and you all help to seek for the content and make the content together. And then here's another map for you. Can you imagine that on, on the left-hand side here you've got degrees of information connectivity and down the bottom you've got degrees of social connectivity. And this is the trajectory we're trying to get to. And if you remember Web 1.0, the first web, the very sticky web, which was all about push technology. I'm nearly finished now. And then you couldn't change that very much, but you could actually change this one, Web 2, social web, where you're looking at now things like blogs and wikis and so on. Web 3 is going to be the semantic web. It's about um, much more rich in terms of information connectivity, but it's not much better in terms of social connectivity. What we need to do is to move towards the meta web. And to summarize, really, this is what we have. Web 1 connected information, Web 2 connected people. Web3 connects knowledge. If there is another version of it, it's going to connect intelligence. We're going to see much more intelligent systems available to us. And this is already happening <clears throat> to a large extent. You go onto Amazon. You buy a book. And it says, oh, did you know that 26 people who bought this book also bought that book? You go, ooh. It's tracking your sentiments. It's a recommender system. This is the start of the intelligent web. And one more, one more thing for you. I'll, I'll just uh, finish off with this quote by Socrates. <laughs> Sorry about this. This is my son who has actually, I asked him to choose a, uh, choose a picture of Socrates for me. It's the wrong Socrates. Let me just try and change this a moment for you. Um, anyway, it was Plato that said this. <clears throat> so I'll find a picture of Plato now. Damn it, that's Socrates. Um, hang on. Right, we've got it right. We've got it right now. We've got it right. What you've seen there, ladies and gentlemen, is a demonstration of the evolution of content on the web, the survival of the fittest content, or Darwickianism. <laughs> Look out for this, because this is going to happen more and more. You're going to see more and more people crowdsourcing their content and more and more people working together collaboratively across the web to actually devise new curricula for the schools. Um, that's finally it. I've been told to wrap up, so here are my contact details. I will be outside afterwards signing books if you're interested in coming and speaking to me. So thank you very much.